Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, we are still waiting for one of our speakers, but since he's running late and we have a, uh, a hard stop at 10 o'clock and a lot to cover, I thought we should start. I'm Jonathan Tepperman. I'm the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. Welcome to this extremely well-timed panel um, on the way forward for Venezuela. Um, well, kudos to the WEF for arranging things uh, in, in Venezuela so that um, this would be so relevant. Um, I normally start panels by giving a, a bit of framing and a bit of context, um, but I suspect that you already know the basics of both the crisis um, in Venezuela, the country's tragic self-destruction um, over recent years, as well as the very dramatic events of the, uh, of the last two weeks and now the last 24 hours. Um, we also happen to have two and eventually three panelists um, up here who know so much more about the issues than I do that I would sound like a complete idiot if I tried to explain them to you. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, let me just quickly introduce my colleagues up here, um, and then we'll go straight into the, um, the, the Q&A. Um, so sitting to my immediate left um, is Gabriela Saada. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, she's a Venezuelan economist um, who, uh, among other things, works on social projects in high-risk and marginalized areas of Caracas. Um, and then to her left is uh, Moises Naim. Moises is a, is a former Venezuelan minister of trade and industry. He's a former executive director of the World Bank, and most important, he's a former editor-in-chief of my magazine, Foreign <laughs> Policy, which he probably still thinks of as his magazine, of Foreign <laughs> Policy. So let's quickly start by bringing everybody up to speed on what exactly is going on. <clears throat> January 10th, Maduro is sworn in um, for a new term as president. Last week, um, Venezuela's Congress declares him illegitimate, and then yesterday, uh, Juan Guaido, the opposition leader, declared himself president. First question, is this going to work? Is this finally the beginning of the end for Maduro and Chavismo? After all, we've seen many attempts by the opposition in years past that have come close and haven't succeeded. Is this time different? Gabriela, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Well, I think there is... Uh, key different factor this time from previous times because uh, we have some actors here. First, we have the international community. We have the opposition leadership uh, through the National Assembly and we have the civil society. So in the past, uh, the civil society took the streets. Uh, they protested um, for even for three months, two years ago, uh, with no results. Uh, and for me, it was I, I perceive that there was a disarticulation of these three actors, and this time it seems like it's different. Uh, we see that the international community uh, is working as one powerful actor, uh, well articulated with the opposition leadership, um, and we also are seeing a huge support from the, from the civil society of Venezuela from all different backgrounds and social classes. Uh, I was, I was very surprised to see the pictures and the videos from yesterday's protest because if you would have asked me a month ago if I believed this was possible, I, I would have said no, but this time it feels that it's different. Um, Moises, everybody seems to be putting their hope in Venezuela's military right now. Is this a good idea? After all, um, Latin American militaries don't exactly have a glorious tradition of defending democracy. Nobody knows. I don't think Maduro knows. I don't think uh, uh, the international community knows. What we can sh safely say is that they are divided, the armed forces, but they are under tight control. It is very important when th thinking about Venezuela these days to always include Cuba. Cuba is a very important player and has transferred, uh, successfully transferred to Venezuela, uh, its technology of repression of, uh, uh, of controlling society. And if you're a dictator, the first thing you want to control is the armed forces. So uh, you know that the, if, you are, if you, you are an authoritarian regime, uh, the only threat you have, the most immediate threat is guys with guns. Mm -hmm. 
and you control them. And the Cubans have done that successfully for decades, and they have transferred that technology to Venezuela. So the military are under tight control. They are monitored, they are punished, they are promoted if they are enthusiastic uh, supporters of the regime. But that is changing and that is fraying, and uh, there is no doubt that part of the military is very, very unhappy with the situation today. So we don't know. We will know more in, in coming uh, hours, days, and weeks. This is not, the, you know, we're, yesterday was an important day, in many ways a happy day for uh, those of us who don't like this regime. But we have to be very careful not to create the expectation that this is done. Uh, the, the rough times lie ahead. Um, Let, I just want to stop you there because I want to follow up on this theme before we move on to something else. Um, you know, from the outside, Maduro seems spectacularly incompetent. The Economist recently called him the world's least successful president. The economy is in free fall, as everybody knows. Last year, inflation was 1 million percent, maybe even higher, um, because uh, uh, statistics are so hard to calculate. The oil industry now produces less than it did in the 1950s. The government is totally isolated. <laughs> He has very powerful enemies, and yet he has nonetheless managed to hold on for, for so long. Um, and um, tell us a little bit more specifically about how he's been able to do it, and, and what will it take for the institutions that have supported him until now, the courts, the military, to finally turn against him? Again, we don't know. Anybody that would claim to know what's going on inside the military is probably not telling the truth. But, but I'm not asking for a pr prediction so much as sort of walk us through what it would take to change their minds. Uh, Juan Guaido, um, uh, just um, a few days ago, circulated a video a, a directed to the armed forces. And his wife, President Guaido's wife, also addressing the wives and the women in the military. And essentially saying uh, it was a message of uh, um, we're not threatening you, we're not going to send you to jail, we want amnesty. Uh, this, you have time, you, you are with us, you are suffering from the situation. Your wives and, and mothers are uh, you know, making, you know, having to go through huge lines just to get food, there are no medicines. Uh, so we are together in this, and so you can join us, and you will not be jailed. We will not persecute you. We, you know, amnesty was a very important thing, and and they are, I think they have been very effective in the message. I don't know what what's happening uh, in, in in the background, Jonathan. If I may, I would like to just mention a couple of things about the international community. When you think, and we're very happy, enthusiastic, and. Uh, as it has been said, it's unprecedented. You know, 50 countries have now uh, recognized President Guaido. Uh, but uh, the international community is not just those that support, uh, that, that don't like Maduro and have broken uh, relationship with him and support the new president. The international community includes, notably in the case of Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Cuba um, Russia, China, and Iran. These are players, these are very important players. And of course, Nicaragua and Bolivia and, 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 uh, and so on. So when, when you think about the international community, it's very easy to fall into the temptation of saying, yeah, these are the good guys. You know, these are the, right. the democracies of the world, the liberal regimes of the world. Well, yes, maybe, but the illiberal regimes of the world are, are still uh, with Maduro. Right, that's right. And in fact, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister last week, explicitly warned the United States against getting too involved, which suggests that um, Venezuela has become a new pawn in a Latin American version of the great game um, between the superpowers. Absolutely. Venezuela was not a geopolitical hotspot uh, until uh, recently. Now it's in play. And Venezuela has the risk of becoming a football mm -hmm. uh, between all these uh, geopolitical players. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, Gabriela, I wanted to ask you about something that we were chatting about before we started, which is the, um, uh, uh, which is the value of U.S. support in the in in uh, particular, because after all, um, uh, the the U.S. does not have the greatest of reputations um, in Latin America, and uh, um, it. Uh, it can sometimes seem like having the U.S. on your side can be the, the worst thing for the popularity of a leader. Um, and yet, the U.S. Has, is now strongly supporting Guaido. Is this actually going to help, or could this make his case more difficult? Yeah, I think it's very helpful. 
Um, right after the United States recognized Guaido and the National Assembly as the only legitimate institution in Venezuela, you could see how other uh, countries followed. And this was all done uh, under the context of the civil society taking the streets. Um, I have been in two communities. I have worked there uh, with people that used to be very, very supportive of the government. People that were uh, polarized, where you could even mention uh, any uh, something positive about the US government. But I think the things have changed. Um, the situation in Venezuela is dramatic. Uh, people cannot find food, they cannot find medicine, and they are starting to point the fingers at the government. Um, the Venezuelan government wants people to believe that this is all part of an economic war that the US has with Venezuela, and that this is the imperialism regime. Uh, but the people in Venezuela, I mean, they, they know what's going on. They go out there and they see that they cannot have uh, fine medications, and they see that in their neighboring countries that have a good relation with the U.S., they can. They are going to Cucuta, they cross borders to buy food, to get food there for their families. So um, I think this mindset has changed a lot, and I think the U.S. plays an important role here. Um, as long as it is uh, done hand in hand with the opposition in Venezuela, as long as they are articulated, I think it's great what they are doing. So beyond the rhetorical support that these 50 countries have now lent uh, Guaido and, and the, uh, the new government, if that's what we can call it, what else should the uh, international community do? What would you like to see other countries do to help move things forward? Well, uh, in my case, um, since this government are already recognizing Guaido as the Venezuelan president, then I would like to see some important actions. For example, um, if Venezuela has delegations in certain uh, international organizations, then well, we should change those delegations. If Venezuela have representatives in embassies of these countries, then we should move on and change those representatives. I think, as well as uh, other important players. I mean, we saw that yesterday, the Inter-American Development Bank also was open to having an open dialogue with the opposition leadership. So I think those are the steps that we would like to see. What about you, Moises? I, I agree. I, I agree with everything Gabriela said. Uh, and um, there is uh, uh, in the next 72 hours are going to be very interesting because, uh, as you know, the President Trump uh, announced that he was uh, not recognizing Maduro anymore, and he recognizes the new president, right? Though. Uh, the reaction, President Maduro's reaction, was uh, uh, to say that he was giving 72 hours to, uh, for the United States to get out of the country, e every one of their uh, um, staffers and, and diplomats. So what happens if that doesn't happen? Uh, immediately after... And the U.S. has said it's not going to withdraw its people. Not only that, the pre pre President Guado had sent a letter uh, asking all the embassies to stay in the country, and especially, he said, we, we want the American embassy to stay here. So here is where what happens with the armed forces, it's very important. What happens if, they, after 72 hours, uh, the Venezuelans decide that they, you know, they, 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 the gringos need to get out, <laughs> and they send the troops to attack the embassy, or to vacate the embassy. That embassy has a very strong contingent of Marines. And just imagine, uh, I don't think this is going to happen, but it, it is not, you know, it, it may be that the Venezuelan armed forces are ordered uh, to vacate the premises of the U.S. Embassy, and the, uh, uh, and, and the American diplomats uh, refuse to leave. So then what happens? I don't think it, it, anything is going to, I don't believe that a, shoot, that a shooting uh, war is going to happen there, but this also illustrates each side will now uh, start putting red lines that uh, should not be crossed and will be crossed. So we're going to see a lot of uh, games and strategic postures of that kind. Let's start talking now about what will happen um, if Guaido succeeds and becomes the uh, recognized president of, of Venezuela, if the military comes around um, uh, and supports him, if Maduro flees to exile in Havana. Um, it seems to me that if all of that happens, um, then that's when the 
actual hard work for Guaido begins. This is the relatively easy part compared to the stuff he's going to have to do um, if, he, if he formally becomes president. Um, let me start by asking you, um, Gabriela, mm -hmm. how divided is uh, Venezuelan society today? Is there a real split among the, um, the Puebla between um, uh, um, supporters of the opposition and, and Democrats and Chavistas? Mm -hmm. Um, well, in my, in my experience, I, I haven't seen that, like, a, 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 an important division in the communities I have worked in. Of course, there are people that <laughs> sympathize with the government. This is a reality still. Um, but most of the people, uh, they just want a change in their lives. They just want to eat three meals a day. They just want to have access to a to public health assistance, they want to have access to quality education. Um, so uh, from the perspective of a transition, well, I can talk from my experience. So um, I have managed to make a difference in such hostile and difficult environments by doing three things. First is uh, finding a common ground with everyone. Um, and that is also speaking the same language, a common language. So. Um, for example, we don't go to the communities and start talking about the problems and we don't go there providing political solutions. We go there but actually uh, to listen what the people have to say, to understanding what's, what's going on and to involve them in a solution. Um, and we try to recognize the problems and how to address them directly. Second, uh, the only way to do this is through cooperation. And we've managed to, to play an important role in communities through network, networks of collaboration. And that is giving everyone a, play to, a, a role to play. There are community leaders, um, there are mothers, there are kids. Uh, everyone plays a role in our solutions. And that is something that we will need in, for the future in Venezuela. Um, we have everyone to have a say in what in the country that they want to see. We, have, we want everyone to build that country. And one of the most successful things that we have managed with these networks of collaboration is organizing communities, something that, something that the government, uh, I think, um, tried to undo. I think the government wanted to disintegrate civil society. And with our work, we managed to organize society and, and overcome power uh, in even in the, in the worst case scenarios. And third, I think it's important to involve the Venezuelan diaspora. Part of our success is that the Venezuelan diaspora have helped us. Um, Venezuela never had experience being a, a, a forced migration. Uh, we never experienced that. We, on, on the contrary, we were a country that used to have uh, a bit large masses of mi migrants. And, but we are starting to organize ourselves, we're starting to understand what it's like to live as a migrant, and the Venezuelan diaspora is playing an important role in supporting organizations in Venezuela and communities, and I think it's really important to involve them in a potential solution and reconciliation. Um, Moises, uh, let's imagine that you were um, Guaido, and um, you become president of, of Venezuela. Um, given how much damage um, the last two presidents have done to the country in um, uh, destroying the economy, eviscerating the state, um, completely sabotaging um, the state oil company, PDVSA, um, doing so much damage um, that nobody knows if, how, and, and whether the, the, the critical oil sec sector um, can recover. What would your list of priorities be in, in, in order? What, how would you rank um, the, the top few jobs? Guado's mandate and mission is to call elections, is not to rebuild Venezuela. Mm. The first priority is to organize free, fair, transparent, internationally observed elections as soon as possible. Uh, meanwhile, and uh, as soon as possible is, is in the, you know, it's not clear what, uh, how, how quickly that can happen, but you need a, a president that has the legitimacy of uh, having won an election. So that's the first priority. Mm -hmm. The second priority is food and medicines. You know, the, the, uh, Venezuela needs, has a very long 
road ahead. Venezuela needs to be rebuilt, relaunched, rethought, uh, remade. Uh, and it's going to take a generation at least. Uh, so the list is, is there, at least we know the list. Uh, it may be that the top uh, of, of a long-term list is to regain the possibility of Venezuelans uh, to walk the streets without being killed or robbed or, or you know, crime. Uh, it's, and uh, Venezuela has the highest, one of the highest homicides rates in the world. Um, it's not safe to walk the streets at any time. It's, 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 it's a, you know, the, the priorities are, is not that difficult to identify the priorities. It's extremely difficult to identify the sequencing. Yeah. Uh, uh, what needs to be done is very clear in what order uh, and what, what is a, de a determinant and what precedes the, the, the what. It, it's, it's, it's a tough one. But, um, but again, uh, the most important thing is to have uh, elections uh, as, as quickly as possible. And where will the money for all of this come from? That's a great question. Uh, Venezuela, as you noted, Venezuela is no longer a petrostate. Venezuela used to be an energy superpower. Uh, Venezuela today is a narco state. Uh, the, the narco business and remittances are now more important for the Venezuelan economy than oil. Uh, so they destroyed, they managed to destroy the, the, the oil industry. That can be rebuilt, but it will take money and, and, and time. Uh, but then uh, Venezuela doesn't have the they destroy the productive capacity of the country. And so um, most of the food and most of the medicine and most of the raw materials, most of the spare parts for cars and for machinery, for industries, need to be imported. And that requires hard currency. Venezuela has not, is not producing hard currency in, in sufficient amounts to feed and, and give health and medicine to its population, period. There are not sufficient calories in Venezuela to feed the Venezuelan population. They need to be imported. And that requires, Venezuela has the most, the massive humanitarian crisis that Latin America has ever experienced and in the world. So that will require massive assistance, uh, which is a tragic paradox because we're talking about the country that sits on top of the largest reserves of oil in the world. But, um, but in the short term, the international community will need to provide uh, aid to Venezuela in the form of food, uh, and, uh, and, and hard currency in order to, to get the, the economy back on its feet. Moises, um, and by the way, I'm going to open things up to the audience in, uh, after this next question because I'm sure all of you have questions. Um, but uh, there's one more question I've always wanted to ask you because of your experience um, in the government in, in the early 1990s. Um, at the time and for years prior to that, as we've noted, Venezuela was this great bastion, a beacon of stability in Latin America and a model um, for the region and for, and for the world, which is part of what makes, a great part of what makes the current situation so tragic and so perverse. My question is, how, what is it, given how successful Venezuela was, that it was able to succumb to um, electoral dictatorship under Chavez. Was there a basic flaw in Venezuela's democracy, even in the good days, um, that Chavez was able to support? Um, and, and how did things get so bad? As you noted in a uh, recent article, which you chose to publish in a uh, magazine other than ours, um, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, and Nicaragua, and Uruguay have all had socialist governments uh, over the last 20 years, and yet none except for Nicaragua have uh, imploded the way Venezuela um, has. Um, so uh, what, was the, the, what were the inbuilt flaws that allowed things to get so bad? And when <laughs> democracy is finally restored, is there anything that Venezuela can do to protect itself from something like this happening in, in the future? That's a, a painful question and uh, has a painful answer. The, um, and, and it's not, it, it, it cannot be done uh, in, in a short uh, phrase. Hola. So, Welcome. Thank you, sorry. Uh, briefly, the typical culprits are uh, corruption the, of, of the elites. Uh, there are inequality uh, in, in society. Um, and, uh, but, but if, and, and, and all sorts of, of indicators. When you look at the tip, when you listen to that and say, well, let me look at the numbers. How did Venezuela look when this happened? And let me look at the numbers. Well, 
if, if, if corruption was the reason why we had someone like Chavez, Colombia, Chile, uh, and others, uh, sorry, Chile, no, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, should have had Chavez before us. If inequality was the main reason, uh, Venezuela was not at the top of the list. Chile was, Colombia was. So if inequality was the reason why this happened, then other countries should have been more at risk. And so you go down the list of the, you know, socialism is, is the culprit. No, as, as you noted in that article, uh, we described how other countries uh, took a, a very socialistic path and they did not implode. The drop in the price of oil, the oil uh, uh, shock is another explanation. Well, there's a lot of oil countries, many of them represented in Davos this year, that suffered a big drop in their revenues as the price of oil went down and they did not implode. So there is a special issue in Venezuela that is complicated. My own personal controversial uh, uh, opinion is that uh, uh, we were occupied stealthily early on by Cuba. And Cuba called the shot and Cuba essentially looted the country. And the policies that were pursued by the government of Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro were not taken and were not thought through uh, in order to help Venezuelans, but to loot Venezuelan riches and uh, uh, support uh, a, a, the, a bankrupt island that is Cuba. But that didn't really reflect an inbuilt design flaw in the Venezuelan uh, of democracy. Or Venezuelan democracy was as flawed as your average democracy in the, in the developing world. Venezuela was not worse that your average uh, defective democ third world democracy. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was better in many ways. Venezuela was, uh, together with Costa Rica, the longest democracy in the region. And we had elections every five years, and you did not know who would won the election. There was, it was competitive. It was, you, you had a Congress that had some checks and balances on the executive. So it was a flawed, defective, limited, uh, troubled democracy in many ways, but it was not more uh, troubled and defective than your average uh, democracy in Latin America. Let me welcome our newest panelist, Jose Valencia, who is the Foreign Minister of Ecuador. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're talking about um, the crisis in Venezuela and, and what's going to happen next. Um, Ecuador is, uh, I believe, one of the 50 countries that has now recognized um, the self-declared President Guaido and, and declared uh, Maduro to be illegitimate. Um, Tell us, what do you think Ecuador, as one is of Venezuela's neighbors, um, what's Ecuador's responsibility here to help? Um, and how can you be helpful? Thank you, thank you. My apologies for being late. I have a last minute issue and uh, I couldn't avoid it. But thank you. It's a, a, I'm very happy to be sharing this, this panel. And uh, well, regarding your, your question, uh, sure, Ecuador is linked to Venezuela by many ways. We've been of course, uh, part of the Gran Colombia, this great country that was at the beginning of the independence, um, just one, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador formed just one state entity, so to say. Uh, we, then we have the cultural links, of course, Latin American nations, same language, same culture, a lot of common you know, uh, uh, interests. And lately, uh, during the uh, government of Rafael Correa, Ecuador was very close to, to Chavez, to Venezuela, to the Bolivarian process. Um, however, with President Lenin Moreno, the successor of President Correa, things started to change from the beginning, I should say. Uh, President Moreno was very critical to uh, the Bolivarian process in many ways. Um, actually, we suffer the consequences of more or less the same politics, especially economic politics that were implemented in Venezuela. Uh, even though we also, uh, we don't have as much oil as Venezuela to export, oil is also the main source of income for the Ecuadorian uh, government. In any, way, in any way, the same policies of expanding the state, of uh, uh, expanding public uh, uh, investments and public uh, expenses produce more or less the same uh, process in Ecuador. No, not as you know, uh, complicated, not as profound, not as uh, uh, difficult as in Venezuela, but we suffer more or less the same situation. 
However, it was a very important difference, I believe. Uh, in Venezuela, it took a much more period of time, you know, to organize the whole political process. Uh, it was a very strong political party in Venezuela, the Socialist, uh, United Socialist Party of Venezuela, I think is the, the name. And especially, of course, the military. The military was part of the Bolivarian process in Venezuela, not in Ecuador. I mean, those two situations, I believe, uh, were uh, very important in defining that Ecuadorian, the Ecuador wouldn't follow the same path as in Venezuela. So there is this first uh, uh, element I would like to, to address. And the second one, of course, is as many other countries in the region, and I should say Colombia, uh, Peru, and Chile, Argentina, we started uh, three, four years ago to uh, receive a very important flow of Venezuelan immigrants, people that were leaving Venezuela because of the harsh economic conditions mainly in that country. And uh, it's a lot of pressure for, I believe, the whole region, and in particular for Ecuador. Uh, we receive about uh, uh, 250,000 uh, uh, Venezuelan immigrants. They are, uh, op Ecuador is open to receive them. I mean, we, they, we don't, they don't need visa to come to Ecuador because of this internal arrangement in the region. However, there's a lot of pressure on Ecuador right now because of that situation. There's a lot of pressure because the economic crisis that we are now uh, experiencing, and it's a, a pressure because even though we don't have as many uh, uh, immigrants, influx of immigrants as in, as in Colombia, if you compare, Colombia is 50 million people, Ecuador is 16 million, the markets uh, in Colombia are bigger than in Ecuador, so if you, uh, you, you put both countries in context, it's more or less the same impact, I should say, with economic crisis that Ecuador is now experiencing. I want to uh, underline that. So, if you get all things together, we're really very close to the Venezuela crisis. Um, to, uh, but we're really close, we're following, I should say, day by day. And we really are very clear on, on one point, that the, uh, the cause of this uh, situation with a lot of migrants coming, etc., is certainly the instability in Venezuela. There's no other explanation. And that instability comes from the economic situation and the political situation as well, the political process. So what can you do to help? First, uh, we've started uh, telling Venezuela what we thought. In the past, there was some sort of um, um, solidarity that was shown by President Correa's regime to Venezuela, that you are okay, just repeating the same script of the Venezuelan authorities. And we started to tell them uh, through diplomatic channels that we didn't agree with that picture, that something was wrong, that we believe that human rights were not being, you know, uh, have not been respected in Venezuela. We criticized elections. So we started with that. And then we show in the international forum, in particular the OAS, our uh, position regarding to that. You know, one year ago, Ecuador criticizes. Uh, criticized the, the elections in Venezuela, the way they, they were conducted. We, we told them in private and also publicly that we disagree with that uh, uh, situation. And things evolved, I don't want to take much, too much time. And as you say, yesterday Ecuador joined other nations in recognizing Juan Guaidó as the interim president in, in Venezuela and calling for elections to be held uh, as soon as it, they can be organized under international supervision, the supervision uh, uh, international uh, oversee, and uh, to have them in order to redemocratize the country, to get the people of Venezuela back into power. That's our actual stand on the issue. I'd like to take uh, questions from all of you now, if you have them. Um, just please raise your hand and we'll get you a mic and introduce yourself um, when I call on you. Anybody? Yes, right here in the front, please. Thank you. My name is Dagmar Rosenfeld. I'm deputy editor-in-chief of the German newspaper Die Welt. And I have a question to Minister Valencia. Um, the US government does not exclude a military intervention in Venezuela. What do you think about a US military intervention? We disagree with that option. We don't believe, we disagree. We are not in agreement. Uh, we believe that uh, a military 
action against Venezuela would have uh, mostly negative impacts. And I wouldn't think that there would be uh, a way out of the situation. We have to give the Venezuelan people the opportunity to decide, to decide by themselves. They have, the, they have to be the actors of their own future. And that's the best way to do it, and it's the democratic way as well. Just by a show of hands, is there anyone here who thinks US military intervention would be a good idea? I, su I suspected so. <laughs> um, next question. Uh, gentleman in the back, please. Yes, good morning. Olivia Pesh, American Towers. A question for you all. Uh, assuming the transition plan announced yesterday prosper, uh, how do you see the, the readiness of the civil society to go back to democracy after 20 years of dictatorship? It's an excellent question. And Gabriela, why don't you start since you represent civil society? Okay. <laughs> well, um, like I said, I think there are many actors involved here. And one, uh, one big player here is the Venezuelan diaspora. I think they are too part of our civil society. They have so much to offer. But the, the biggest challenge, I think, will be how to, how to fill all the places that we will need uh, all those jobs that we will need in order to rebuild the country because we have experienced a mass exodus. So I think that will be one big challenge, but um, it's going to be hard. You know, I was, I was, asked, I was speaking about this with my friends uh, at work. We don't know what it's like to live under a democratic regime. And I mean, I have lived under the Chavismo since I was six years old. So for me, this will be something completely new, but we have all the motivation to work in rebuilding our country. If you see the initiatives that there are in Venezuela right now, the young people are leading many organizations and many initiatives in order to rebuild the, the, the society, in order to be more inclusive. So um, I think this is an important uh, step that we are taking. Um, even though we don't have national positions or we are not filling um, spaces in, gover in government positions, um, from the communities that we are working in, from those spaces at the bottom, I think the young people in Venezuela, in Venezuela are doing a great job in trying to rebuild the society and, and empower the civil society because this, this situation has been very dehumanizing for all of us. And I think that's, that's where I, I think that's where things should start. Moises, I want to pick on you since you represent the diaspora um, <laughs> and the brain drain. Unfortunately. What is your responsibility uh, as the diaspora to, to help in this process? Huge, huge. Um, uh, the, the, dias the Venezuelan diaspora is very young. Uh, as Gabriela said before, Venezuelans did not leave their country. Venezuela. To the contrary, Venezuela absorbed a large number of, of, of immigrants, first from Europe, from, uh, from Spain and from Italy, from Portugal. We had a massive uh, European immigration, then from neighboring countries. But we never had the experience of Venezuelans living abroad, which we now have. These are people that... And the number uh, is something like 5 million? 3 million it's, refugees, it's, but I think yeah. overall the, the number yeah. is much larger. It's, it's, yeah. Nobody knows, uh, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's, it's a very large, it's 10%. Think about it as the 10% of the population of the country, roughly. And it's going to go up uh, because the crisis this year in 2019, the economic crisis in Venezuela is going to become even more acute. And, 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 and these are desperate people that are just walking. Uh, to, to the borders of the country just to escape a harrowing situation uh, of no food, no medicine, no safety, no schools, no hospitals. So, so uh, and, and the diaspora, uh, and again, the diaspora is young, is not organized. They, they are, at this point, their priority is adapting uh, and surviving and, and making it in a different country. Uh, so, and they are different. There, there is a professional, uh, the brain drain the diaspora. Uh, there, are, there are the refugees, just the economic uh, uh, refugees that are just seeking uh, uh, shelter and, and food and the medicines for the family. So, but the, the future will require a very active, very well-organized, well-funded uh, diaspora Venezuela. Uh, can have access to resources uh, of the Venezuelan people abroad, and that includes both human capital and financial uh, capital. Next question. Gentleman in the back, please. 
Hi, good morning. My name is Sam. I'm a journalist with CNBC in London. I wanted to ask the panel about um, the military in Venezuela, because much seems to depend on what they do next. I think it was said earlier that several high-ranking officials are quite happy with Maduro at the minute. But with the pressure from the international community, would you expect uh, a domino effect from lower-ranking officials? Who wants to speak to that? Gabriel is an expert on military uh, <laughs> On everything. <laughs> I mean, there has been this very concerted attempt, as we've discussed, to chip away, to peel away, especially low-ranking, especially poor members of the military, and get them to side with the people from which, of course, they come. Um, do, you, do you see that succeeding? You're asking? Any, no, I was asking Gabriella, so, actually. So uh, she, go ahead. She's our military expert. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an incontrovertible fact and an irony that, of course, the military, there is no distinction between the military and the people. The military is the people, and yet so far they have sided with the regime, not with the people. But this seems like a moment when that allegiance could shift. Well, we've seen um, small groups of militaries uh, kind of uh, rebelling against the government, but uh, I think as of now, we don't have a clear answer to that. Um, as Moises said previously, um, the opposition is open to offer amnesty to top-ranked officials in the military. The opposition is also open to dialogue with the military in Venezuela, and we do believe they play an important role here. We do believe uh, they are an, an important actor, of course, in this, in this transition. But I think this is very recent, and we don't know uh, what the response will be. We listened yesterday to some uh, um, statements, uh, but, but still, it's, we don't know what's going on there. Some people say there are many divisions and uh, there, is, there is a discontent among many militaries. But then um, we, at least, I don't have uh, contact with them, so I, don't, I cannot speak on their behalf. It seems to me that it'll come down to, it has to come down to a question of self-interest in the military. And at a certain point, they have to decide which path offers a, a better future yeah. for them. Yeah, I think their, their costs of supporting the government uh, are, are higher and higher every day. Yeah. There is no doubt that the behavior of uh, guys with guns will define much of what will happen in the coming days and, and will shape politics in Venezuela. I just want to add that guys with guns in Venezuela do not only uh, include the military. Venezuela has a presence, a very significant presence of the ELN, which is a, 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 a guerrilla force, a Colombian guerrilla force. The FARC and the remnants of the FARC and those that uh, escaped Colombia are also operating in Venezuela. Uh, we, uh, Venezuela has, is a criminalized country in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's rife with bands and gangs and, uh, uh, and organized crimes, uh, both local and transnational. So, yes, the military are the, the definitive, the determined, the critical in defining uh, politics and outcomes. But after that is done, uh, there is another segment of guys with guns that are may, maybe even uh, more lethal and more dangerous. And do you think effectively they'll have a vote in this process? And, I'm sorry? And do you think effectively that the narcos and the, the cartels and, and, not, and, and the, the guerrillas will have a vote in the process in the sense that which way they decide to go could be decisive or help determine the outcome of, of this process? I don't know that they will be decisive. I know that they will not be relevant. Right. Uh, remember, be relevant ir irrelevant. irrelevant. They, they will be relevant. I don't know if they're going to be decisive. Yeah. Uh, and remember that uh, most of the higher-ranking uh, officials in the Venezuelan, uh, the, the guys at the top are are, um, are criminals. Uh, they are involved in all kinds of uh, uh, criminal activities, uh, uh, from extortions to, 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 to drug trafficking, to mine, illegal mining, to... So it is a very dense uh, uh, network of uh, uh, criminal uh, gangs and organizations. And as I said, some local and some transnational. And what's the most we can help for during this process, that they just stay quiet? Uh, well, uh, well, we, what, what we can hope for, we should, is that they don't go out shooting in, uh, in defense of Maduro. Right. Uh, 
and Maduro is closely tied with them, and, and the Maduro entourage. Remember, two of his stepchildren are in jail in the United States for uh, drug trafficking. So we're not talking here about, uh, uh, you know, this is a, 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 an ecosystem that is a highly criminalized ecosystem that in, in, intersects the state, the armed forces, and the criminal organizations together. Uh, and, and, you know, you, that will need to be uh, uh, unbundled and dissected and done away, but it's going to take a while. Yes, please. Just wait for the mic, please. So, Lourdes Casanova from uh, Cornell University. So, I was, as I was saying in another panel, China's economic interests in Venezuela are very important, and the last one was uh, that they have bought about 10% of PDVSA. Uh, my, okay, if I follow what China does in Latin America, in general, they don't mind. There is a change of regime and they adjust to the new one. But any news from, or any first reactions from Chinese embassy or China no. in this situation? So far, we haven't heard from, from China. Mm -mm. But we will. <laughs> Next question. Yes, right here. My name is Martin Bert from Fundacion Paraguaya. This um, week, Paraguay uh, celebrates the 30th anniversary of the overthrow of the dictator Strassner. 34 years of exile, of persecution, of deaths, and everything. And, uh, Democracy happened over new constitution, municipal, independent municipal elections, a new Supreme Court, a new, um, uh, a new system, a new market economy. So it will come. And the, the big challenge is to prepare for that change. So uh, I don't recommend a, uh, mili a foreign military uh, intervention. I agree with the foreign minister of Ecuador, it has to be a, um, um, a uh, Venezuelan uh, solution, but we have to support democracy. But let me ask you, when, when Paraguay made this dramatic shift, were there other models that it looked at to learn lessons for how to do it right? And by the same token, are there other models now that Venezuela should look to as it tries to figure out the answers to all these difficult questions? Well, um, there was a, uh, of course, the number one uh, uh, issue was Jimmy Carter's human rights policy. That gave a very clear signal that Jimmy Carter was not with Pinochet from Chile, was not with Strassner, and of course then the, the changes came in, in Brazil and with Alfonsín in Argentina. But uh, that, that is the model. That, that is the model. And the people of Venezuela will follow a, democ uh, a democracy if they are allowed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your neighbor, I believe, had a question as well. Hi, I'm Marco from Mercury. Can the panel help us trying to find different scenario possible which may evolve in the next few days? I understand no one knows, you know, next 48 hours, next 72 hours, and so on and so forth, but there must be, we, we must be able to kind of see maybe a few scenarios. One scenario, obviously, Maduro stays in, the Russian. Ca can you just develop possibility, or is that just too, too wide possibility to actually be specific? Do you want to do take well, an extra <laughs> uh, I will Lange, save them yeah. now from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, probably I, I couldn't go, of course, in, into specifics because I'm foreign affairs in another country. I couldn't be in the way of intervening in. in no, foreign please be as Venezuela. undiplomatic <laughs> as you'd like to be. We're all friends right. here. No, but, but really, if we uh, remember other experiences in Latin America, which is nece what is necessary, I believe, and it's very logic, other way. Is, is to establish channels of dialogue uh, between the different actors inside Venezuela. Um, different actors, I mean, not only uh, among the, the, the opposition, of course, but to reach the military, uh, to reach the uh, uh, government uh, party of Chavistas. So let me ask you, I mean, is there any sort of trusted interlocutor, it, maybe uh, Ecuador, maybe some other country, who can act as an honest broker who everyone will talk to, who Maduro will talk to, who uh, uh, Guaido will talk to, who the military will talk to. Is there anybody in the region who all sides could, could take as an impartial 
arbiter? I was going to that point. Yes, I, I would identify exactly who, what country, what group of countries, but somebody has to do that or to facilitate that job. And uh, in the past, in Central America, we experienced more or less the same dynamics. You know, very harsh opponents were com they came together uh, due to international uh, facilitation, so to say. I'm not saying this is easy, of course, it's mm -hmm. very complex, but we have to give a try on that. And I believe internationally there could be some actors, some countries perhaps that Maybe could a, help Maybe like a, a, a contact group of uh, several international right. countries. The same, or, exactly, the same Contadora or Rio group uh, uh, um, uh, facilitation that happened in the past in Central America. And Moises, do you think uh, Cuba should be part of this process or should they be excluded? Yeah, absolutely. Again, in terms of scenarios, it's very hard and everything is moving and is in flow and it's unclear. And there's a lot of path dependency here. You know, where we're going is going to depend a lot on what happens. But the two basic scenarios still is confrontation or uh, negotiation. You either, we either evolve into a situation in which negotiations are started with all uh, the actors that have veto powers, that have uh, influence, that have resources, that, have, uh, that are a able to, 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 to use violence. So you, you need to, to either negotiate with them or confront them. And those are the two essential scenarios. And I, in, in, in coming days and, and weeks and months, we're going to see which of the two is going to prevail, uh, the negotiations or the confrontations. Next question. Well, we only have a couple of minutes. Uh, yes or no? Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, tell me what's, what's Sorry, wrong. Sorry, just introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Ricardo Hausman. I'm a professor at uh, Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, uh, right now, you have uh, uh, an elected institutional power that has made some decisions on how to create a process that brings the country back to democracy. Stage one. Number two, you have massive international support for that process of returning the country to democracy led by an interim president. Number three, you have massive popular support uh, of that process. Number four, you have a well-specified and presented and discussed economic and social plan for that transition government to reestablish, to, to deal with the humanitarian crisis, to, uh, to recover the economy, uh, to stop hyperinflation. Uh, the only thing that remains is for the armed forces to realize that they cannot use the coercive power of the state to prevent this process from happening. So I would like to understand why is it uh, that a scenario where they just say, where the armed forces just say, <clears throat> sorry, it would be too costly for us to trade, try to maintain Maduro in power, given this coalition of forces and given this hope that Venezuelans have that there is a better alternative to their current reality. Why can't we imagine that the armed forces just tell Maduro to leave? That's my first question. My second question is, what kind of assistance, beyond economic assistance, what kind of assistance do you think Venezuela might need to reestablish the monopoly of violence over the country? Uh, we know how much assistance Colombia had to try to reestablish the monopoly of power. So, I would like to ask Moises in particular, how does he think that in a transition government, a, a, the international community might assist the reestablishment of the monopoly of violence in the country? Well, Thank I think you. to your first question, we would all uh, agree that that's precisely what we hope will happen. Um, and uh, uh, now it's up to the military to make the right choice. But um, let's speak to your second. I mean, what is required? Do we need a plan Venezuela like there was a plan Colombia? But let me first speak to the first question, because it's a very important question. I think Ricardo Hausmann's list is correct. Right. All, all of the I, boxes he checked are checked. You're right. But there are boxes that he didn't mention that are part of the, of the play that I mentioned before. You were not uh, in the room yet. There are other actors that you have not mentioned that matter. 
Cuba, Rusia, uh, Russia, China, Iran, they are players. And they may not be uh, aligned to the 50 countries that have recognized. Uh, their preferences may be different. And they will play a role. They will have a role. And uh, it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, not all in the international community are friends of Venezuelan democracy. Some are friends of their very narrow, specific interests uh, and, uh, and very liberal in their way. So the list is correct. It's a wish list. It's very practical. It's real. It's my list, too. But let's not forget that there is another list. So that's, that's one. Um, and uh, also, I said it before, Venezuela has the largest uh, humanitarian and institutional collapse we have seen in, in years, no, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but in the world, in many, ma in many important ways. And, and that comes with a heavy, heavy uh, dose of, uh, of criminal activity and, and, and gun use and homicide rates. And, and yes, Ricardo uh, is absolutely right that this will require solve it, it will require a, a lot of, uh, we will need a plan Venezuela, not unlike plan Colombia, not to deal with guerrillas, but to deal with a plethora of armed uh, criminal gangs uh, and organized crime in Venezuela. So unfortunately it's 10 o'clock, which means we have to stop, but I'm delighted to say that at this moment, um, when so much of the global politics in the world and the trends seem so gloomy, we're able to talk about a moment in a country that has suffered so much, which seems incredibly hopeful. Um, and on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists. And I have, I have one more note to add, which is this is the special Davos issue of our magazine foreign <laughs> policy and there are copies of them in a cardboard box right by the door which you're welcome to take on your way out thank you all so much